the local church this lesson teaches us about the local church the role and function of the believer in the local church emphasizing the need for believers to be a committed part of a local church we've been doing a series on uh, on what what we call as foundations and it's track 1 taking a believer uh to becoming a disciple and we've been doing different lessons in this series called foundations just covering some basic things about the christian faith uh what we all um have to be uh grounded in and this morning it's lesson number 8 we're going to talk about the local church and um we're going to spend some time here just understanding some truths concerning the local church its natural dimension and its spiritual dimension and uh, it's not necessarily a complete study or a com- exhaustive study on the church on the local church itself but some basic things you and I need to understand concerning the local church in matthew the 16th chapter matthew 16 verses 15 to 19 jesus And it's a very familiar passage of scripture. Jesus asks his disciples, he says, you know, hey, what's going out there? What do people who do people say I am? And uh his disciples said, you know, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you are Elijah and so on, or one of the prophets. So Jesus asks them, who do you say that I am? What do you say I am? and peter responds immediately even without thinking he says you are the christ the son of the living god and jesus responds back to peter and says peter flesh and blood has not revealed it to you it's like all these young people in the village they never been to school flesh and blood has not revealed who jesus is to them but they know you are Jesus the Christ nothing is impossible they know it in their hearts so Jesus said flesh and blood has not revealed it to you but my father in heaven has revealed this to you and then he continues he says peter you are peter but upon this rock this rock that Christ is the son of the living god on this rock i will build my church so let's say this together jesus said i will build my church See, some of us don't like church. Relax. Jesus said, "I will build my church." The church is God's idea. The church is a good thing. Now, denominations are the problem. Denominations are man-made. God didn't create them. Denominations are man-made, and that's the problem. But the church is God's idea. Jesus said, "I will build my church." It's a good thing. and uh, he said the gates of hell will not prevail against the church uh, and we've studied this before it tells us that the church advances against the gates the power centers of hell and those powers of darkness will not be able to stop an advancing church and he says i will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven the church has the authority of heaven given to it vested in it and he said you bind on earth what is bound in heaven you release on earth what is released in heaven so the church that jesus is building is an overcoming church it's a church that is vested with authority from heaven it's a church that brings heaven here into our realm that's the assignment of the church that's the kind of church jesus is building so let's talk a little bit this morning about the church and understand our role our place and function in the church the church the meaning of the word church simply means a gathering of people called together for a common purpose that's all the church is a gathering together of people for a common purpose when we gather together because we are believers in the lord jesus christ we gather together in the name of the lord jesus christ for a common purpose we are the church so there's nothing complicated about what the church is i want to talk a little bit about the spiritual aspect of the church and just a few thoughts here again not necessarily everything that we that the new testament teaches about the church but a few thoughts here the church is christ's 
body. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, And He is the head of the church. Christ is the head of, it, of the church. And he, uh, and he is above all, which is His body. And He is above all things, so that in all things He may have the preeminence. Christ is the head of the church, which is His body. And God has designed that Jesus must have the preeminence in everything in the church. Amen? The church is Christ's body. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. But here's an important truth in Colossians 1.18. God has designed that in the church, Jesus must be preeminent. So the moment a gathering together of people for a common purpose, or let me put, it, put the positive first. So when we gather together as believers for a common purpose, we must ensure that Christ is preeminent. Otherwise, we may fail to be the church. Are you with me? Amen? Easy to understand, right? In all things, he must be preeminent, foremost, number one. He is the head of the church. So when we gather together, we must make sure Christ is preeminent. So let me put it, put it in the negative. The moment people to gather together, even though they gather together in the name of Jesus, but Christ is not preeminent, we can question whether that is the church. Amen? I'll let you think about that for a while. Close Ephesians chapter 1 verse 22 and 23 says this, And that God has made him to be the head over all things for the church or to the church, which is his body. And he fills all things everywhere, verse 23, with himself. Two important things I want to highlight from Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. The first is this. It says here that God made him to be the head over all things for the church. The reason God made Christ to be head over all things, one of the reasons Ephesians 1, 22 says, is for the church. The body carries the same authority as the heads. Amen? It's not that the head has one level of authority in the body the other. No. The body carries the same authority as the head. And here it says the reason God made Christ to be head over all things, I mean gave him absolute authority, is for the benefit of the church. So that the church can walk in that realm of authority. Amen? You with me on that? The second thing I want you to see in Ephesians 1 and verse 23 says, He fills everything, everywhere with Himself. Every part of the body is filled with Christ Himself. So you might say, well, I'm just a tiny weeny part of the body of Christ. Don't trouble me. But listen, no matter how tiny weeny part of the body of Christ you are, you are filled with Christ Himself. It is not that somebody has more of Christ than you. You are filled with Christ. Because Ephesians 1.23 says, He fills every part of the body with Himself. Amen? You, as a part of the body of Christ, can fully manifest Christ. Because He fills you. However small a part of the body you are, He fills you with Himself. Amen? So don't discredit yourself saying, oh, I'm just a nobody in the body of Christ. You can't be a nobody when Christ fills you with himself. You are somebody. Whatever your role, whatever your place in the body, you are there filled with Jesus, full, have, having full capacity to manifest Jesus Christ to the world. Number two, the church is eternal because Christ, the head, is eternal. Some people say, I can't wait to get to heaven. There will be no church there. Listen. 
The church is eternal. You can't get away from it. Amen. The church is eternal because Christ the head is eternal. And his body is not going to go away. This is a spiritual body. It's eternal. You'll always be part of the church. His body. Number three. The church is the instrument to execute Christ's purposes. Christ is the head, the command center. We are his body. The body carries out what the head commands. We are his hands and his feet. So the reason we are here on the earth is so that whatever the, the head, Jesus Christ, commands, we execute, we carry out. We be his hands and feet here on earth. So we've got purpose in being the church. Amen? Number four, very obvious, every believer is a member of Christ's body, the eternal church. If you're a believer, you're part of that body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27 says, you are the body of Christ and an individual member of that body. You're a part of that spiritual body of Christ. So that's about the spiritual church which is made up of all believers from all nations, across all languages, across all time. We all belong to that spiritual body, which is the body of Christ. Now, we all like that. We receive that. But what we don't like is the local church. That's a big headache. Let's talk about the local church a little bit. So, truths concerning the local church. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, in fact, many of the epistles that Paul wrote were written to local churches. In that, he did teach about the spiritual body, but a lot of the letters, remainder of the letters, addressed the local church. A people in a local place, in a local community, gathering together for a common purpose. So the local church is an important aspect of New Testament Christianity, of New Testament faith. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Paul is writing to Timothy. He says, Timothy, all these things I have written to you that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. So he's saying, Timothy, I've written all this so that you will know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, the local church. So the epistle, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, were instructions on how the local church must function. And here's what Paul refers to the local church as. He says, how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God. The local church is called the house of God. The same term that Paul uses when he refers to the household of faith, the body of Christ, the spiritual body. So he uses the same term interchangeably. What is true about the spiritual body is now said, true to be, uh, said to be true of the local church. He says, I'm Writing this to you so that you know how to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the pillar and ground of truth. So the local church in any community is supposed to be the pillar, meaning the upholder of truth. It is supposed to be the ground, the mainstay, the foundation of truth in that community. So even if that community is in darkness, even if that community is going away from the truth, and away from uh, right and wrong. There is something in that community, the church, the local body of believers, that is the pillar and ground of truth. Amen? So in any society, if people want to know the truth, they just need to look at the church. The local church. Look at those people. They walk in truth. They walk in light. They have absolutes. They are the pillar and the ground of truth. That's what the local church is supposed to be. Let's say, the, we can make these following statements about the local church. Number one, the local church is called the household of God. Meaning it's the family of God. It's, it's people in relationships like a family. The family of God. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It means there is mutual care, love and support. It also means there are people in different stages of growth and maturity. Number two, the local church is a physical expression of the spiritual body of Christ in a certain area, in a certain geographical region. So in that church, in that local area, the local church is the expression of that spiritual body. How do I live out my membership in that spiritual body? It's in the context of the local church. Number three, 
the local church in a certain area is Christ's instrument to execute His purposes in that area. Amen? So why are we here? Because we are His body and we are here to execute the purposes of Jesus in this place. He's the head. He's got certain things He wants to see done in this part of our city, in this part of our nation. And He's counting on you and me as the local church to make that happen. We are His body. And as we are faithful in our city, in the kingdom of God, faithfulness brings promotion. As you're faithful in your city, it's going to extend your influence into your state. As you're faithful there, you'll extend your influence across the nation. As you're faithful there, you'll extend your influence across nations. But faithfulness is important. Amen? If we will faithfully represent Jesus in our city, He will give us authority over many cities. If we faithfully represent Jesus across the influence He has given us today, He will extend our influence across nations. But we must be faithful as the body of Christ to do what He wants us to do. Amen? So that leads us to the next question. Why should somebody be a committed part of a local church? I mean, why, just, why can't I just be a part of that spiritual body and just be happy? Don't get, in, don't, don't get close to the local church. It's too messy. Too many wrong things. Too many things going wrong. Full of hypocrites. I can't find a perfect church. I mean, you show me a perfect church, I'll join that church. So, just stay away from local church. I'll be a part of that spiritual body. Why should I be committed to a local church? Here are some reasons. Number one, the local church is also God's idea. Amen? The local church is God's idea. Jesus said, I will build my church. And he referred to the spiritual body. And that spiritual body gives expression in reality, in practice to the local church. That's God's idea. Number two. It's in the context of a local church that you and I live out our membership in that spiritual body. In that spiritual body, you have a role, you have a function, you have a place. How are you going to fulfill it? You can't play guitar up in the clouds and have the angels sing for you. It's out here in the local church. You exercise your gifts, your talents, your uh, whatever role and function God has for you. It's in the context of the local church. You live it out. You fulfill it. You grow in your call. You grow in what God has for you. There is strength, support, and encouragement. We do a lot more together. There are things that happen in a cluster that an individual grape cannot produce. You don't get wine out of an individual grape. You need a cluster. The anointing flows through the cluster. Each grape is important, but there's a lot more that happens through the cluster. And lastly, we need to be a committed part of a local church because the body that represents or typifies the church, we learn an important lesson from the body. The body, body parts don't float around. I'm glad my arm is with me all the time. That I don't have to find a man, where's my arm right now? It's like, <laughs> no, it's attached to the body. It's a committed part of me. And so also as in members in the local body, we need to be committed, part of that body. So, it's important for us to understand that commitment to a local church, being a meaningful member, a meaningful part of that local church is important. It's part of our life as believers. What is the mission of the local church? So if we have gathered together for a common purpose, how do we describe that purpose? And I've put down five things together that I see as themes in the New Testament that describe uh, the mission of the church. Now you may find variations to this, but I, I believe this kind of summarizes the common mission of the local church. Number one, the local church involves in evangelism and mission. So as a local church, we are, we're here to win souls, win people to Jesus, bring people out of darkness into His marvelous light. Whether it's in a city 
or whether it's out in the rural parts of India, that's, that's part of our responsibility. That's a part of our common purpose, evangelism and missions. Secondly, discipleship. It's not enough to win people to Jesus. You've got to disciple them. You've got to show them how to walk their walk with God and how to grow in their faith. Discipleship is an important part of the local church. Third, prayer and worship. We offer to God prayer and worship. We connect with God. We are grow in our relationship with God through prayer and worship. Number four, fellowship. That's us living together as a family, having meaningful relationships, connecting with other people, growing together as a family. And number five, it's ministry, equip, equipping people for ministry. So not only do we win souls, not only do we disciple them in the faith, but we equip people for ministry. Eventually, everybody should be involved in doing ministry. So five-fold purpose of the local church. Let's say it together. Number one, evangelism and missions. Number two, discipleship. Number three, prayer and worship. Number four, fellowship. Number five, equ equ ministry, equipping for ministry. Number five. So a good, healthy church will have all these in proper balance. There may be seasons when we focus on a particular thing. We focus on prayer. There may be seasons when we focus on worship. Or maybe seasons we try to build fellowship. But over the long run, all these should be held together in balance. Prayer and worship is our vertical dimension, connecting with God. Evangelism and missions. Discipleship and equipping and ministry is a horizontal. Undergirding all of this is fellowship. If we don't have good relationships with one another, we can't do any of the above. So everything breaks down. So undergirding everything is that relationship, meaningful relationships. Now you can't connect with everybody, but at least you connect with a few people. Have meaningful relationships as part of your growing in faith. So, as a local church, we try to keep all these in balance. We can't emphasize one more than the other. Amen? And all of us engage in these five aspects of the life of the church. I want to just bring our attention to some analogies the New Testament uses for the local church. And I will talk about that and we'll close. A local church is compared to a body, a human body. Is compared to a household or a family. Is also compared to an army. And we just want to talk a little bit about these three aspects of the life of a local church. Body, family, army. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 to 27, Paul describes the Corinthian church as a body. He says, you are the body of Christ and members one of another. And he says, and God has set each one in their own place, just as it pleased him. Every person has a set place in the body. That means you are a particular specific member in the body. God has set each one as it pleased him. Just where it pleased him, he put you there. You have a specific place that God has for you. Something that he's happy about. He's pleased in putting you there. And so it's important that as a body, each one of us find our place. And say, so, you know, I have a purpose. I have a meaningful role and function in the body. I am not just a church attender. Amen? My role as a Christian is not just to attend church. Look, church is a body. You, you have a role. You have a place. You have a function in that body. And God has appointed that place just as it pleased him. Meaning he says, I'm so happy. I'm going to put Steve here. I'm so happy and I'm going to put Joshua here. I'm so happy I'm going to put, you know, um, Jeff here. And each one. Just as it pleased us. I'll put them there. They have a role. They have a function. They'll do it. So as a part of the local church, you need to understand. You've got a place. You got a function. And that was not given to you by your pastor. It was given to you by Jesus Christ Himself. Amen? 
So don't come to the pastor and say, Pastor, tell me what's my function. So go ask Jesus. You know. Now, I can help you. As pastors, we can help you discover that purpose and function. But understand that your function, your place in the body, in the local church, was given to you by Jesus, not by some man. Meaning, it's serious business. It's serious business. Amen? It's not like, oh, pastor wants me to do this now. I mean, why can't I find somebody else to do it? Listen, it's not about finding somebody to do something. Jesus has a role and a place and a function for you in the local church. He set each member as it pleased him. Amen? And then Paul continues over there in 1 Corinthians 12. He says, you know, the eye can't say to the hand, I have no need of thee. The hand can't say to the leg, I have no need of thee. Meaning, we need each other. We're not independent of each other. We need one another in the local church, in the body. None of us can survive independently. Another reason why you need to be part of that local body. Then he continues in that same chapter. He says, you know, there are some parts of the body that are not visible on the outside. And yet, God gives greater honor to such members of the body. Meaning, don't think that it's only those people who stand up on stage that they get great honor in the eyes of God. No. God gives those invisible members, those hidden members of the body, God gives them greater honor. So the way God looks at honor is very different from the way man looks at it. So some of you may have hidden roles, hidden functions. You may have behind the scenes roles and behind the scenes functions. But understand that God gives you greater honor than the visible people who stand up there and get all the hand clap. Amen? That's part of the body. Now, it is interesting to compare the physical body with the spiritual body. In the physical body, we have nine systems. I'm not a doctor, but some basic biology. There are nine systems in the body. And for a body to be healthy, all nine systems have to function well. Any one of these systems break down, you need fixing. Therefore, in the local church, it's important for us to have these same nine functions going on well for us to be a healthy body, a local body. Here are the nine. You've got the circulatory system. It takes oxygen and nutrients and makes sure every cell gets it. So we've got to have means in the local body to reach nutrients and supply and nourishment to every cell in the body. Everyone must get that. One of the ways we try to do it, of course, Sunday morning services, we try to bring nutrient and nourishment to everyone. The life groups are an important part of this, making this happen. Number two, the skeletal system. If we didn't have the bones, everyone would be like a lump of jelly. Some of us with our bones. It's okay. But you need a skeletal system to hold the body up, to give it shape, form, structure, help it do all it needs to do. So also in the local church, you need to have form and structure. You need to have proper leadership, organization, administration, so that the body can function properly. Otherwise, it will be chaos. That's why you have leaders, you have teams, you have people given responsibilities and they have the skeletal system. Number three, you have the muscular system. Without the muscles, the body is unable to move, unable to get things done. So in the spiritual body, every believer must put on some muscles. They need to be equipped so that they can get the job done. So equipping is an important part of the look of the body. Number four, digestive system. You got to ensure strong, timely Delivery of pizzas and burgers. Good food. Healthy food. <laughs> Same way for the local body. 
There's got to be good, timely, anointed ministry of the word that brings nourishment and strength, uh, spiritual strength to people. Number five, there's a respiratory system. You need to have good air supply, oxygen. So also for the local body, through prayer and worship, we need to have the freshness and the anointing of God's presence and God's spirit in our midst. Otherwise, we'll all suffocate and die. That's why prayer and worship is important. That's why every day, every Sunday, 10 to 10.30 is important. Come for prayer. Amen? It's a time when we get in together in prayer and seek God for the freshness of His presence. The nervous system, there is keen sensitivity and perception. Is any part of the body in trouble? Come on, do some remedial action. Protect the body. Do something about it. So we also need to have a, a good nervous system. Getting to know what's happening in different people's lives. Responding quickly to be able to um, minister to those needs. This happens through our member care. It also happens when we care for each other like that. When there's a need, respond, help. Be a part of that nervous system. Number seven is the endocrine system, which is, which is small amounts of different chemicals that are needed in the body. Any of these chemicals go off balance, either too much of it or too little, then the body goes into, has some problems. So in the local church, you need small amounts of good things. You need our core values, culture, discipline, our fellowship, various things, but they need to be in the right balance. You have too much of it or too little of it, the body is in trouble. I need to fix it. There is the excretory system, which is a way of getting rid of unwanted things. So when unnecessary things get into the body, we need a way to get rid of it. Eliminate the waste, eliminate the wrong things, and as individuals and as a body. And then there is a reproductive system, meaning we reproduce, we multiply. So as individuals, we reproduce, we touch more lives, win people to Jesus. As a church, we reproduce, we go out and plant more churches. Some people wonder, why, why is APC so interested in planting more churches? It's very normal. Reproduction is normal. We need to plant more. We need to go across the nation, raise up more churches. That's God's design. A local church has to be a reproducing body. So here are these nine systems that we need as, be as a body of believers. Second aspect, we're a family, a spiritual house. In a family, we need to have good relationships, connect with people. So there is this disadvantage in being a large body where it's so easy to come in and go out and have no relationships with people. It no longer becomes a family, it just becomes an event we attend. So I want to encourage us, when you think about the church, think about it as a family. Let me connect, even, and I'm not asking you to connect with everybody, it's not possible. But connect with a handful of people that you can relate to. You can have meaningful relationships with as a family of believers centered around Jesus Christ. Grow together in the faith. Encourage one another. Be a support to one another as a family. A local church is supposed to be a family, a household of God. Christ is the master of the house. He is the head. He's the patriarch of the family. But in the family, we have people in all different stages of growth and maturity. We've got little children. They run around all over. Get everybody's attention. Then you've got teenagers. They've got their own issues. Then you've got the young adults. More serious, complex problems. Major decisions to be made. And then you've got grown-ups. And then you've got fathers and mothers in the house. You've got different pe people in different stages of growth. In the local church. So also in this family. If you came to APC and you thought everybody was fathers and mothers. No. It's not true. We've got kids here. I mean spiritual kids. <laughs> we've got spiritual teens. We've got spiritual young people. We've got spiritual fathers and mothers. And we've got people in different stages of growth and maturity. Now when you have kids in the house. The house is a little messy. They throw the toys all around and, you know, splatter food everywhere. And so, you see, in the same way, when you come to the church, the local church, it's not always clean. Why? Because we've got kids. We've got teenagers. 
We've got young adults, people growing in their faith. And so, depending on their level of stage where they are and their growth, that much of tolerance, that much of grace is given. More grace to the little ones. They can mess around and just give more grace. But as you grow, you're expecting responsibility and maturity. Is that right? As they grow, you expect them to keep the room clean, make their own bed. Some of them cook your own food. Responsibility, maturity. And eventually, everyone is expected to become a father and a mother in the house of God. Amen? So you look at the house of God, the church as a family. You ask yourself, I've been here in the church for so many years. Have I been growing? Have I been maturing? Have I been moving from being a child to growing up in my faith and growing on to taking on more responsibility and showing signs of maturity? And have I, am I moving on to becoming a father and a mother in the house of God, in the local church, where I can now nurture other people in the faith and I can take care of the kids and the teens and the young adults and nurture them in the faith? Am I, is that happening in my life? It ought to be happening. The church is a family. Lastly, the church is an army. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So immediately he's talking about conflict. So as a church, as individuals and as a body collectively, we are engaged in spiritual conflict. We are an army of God's people. We are in a combat zone. So right now, you're in the middle of conflict. You and I are in the middle of conflict. We're in a combat zone. There's an enemy. There are individual battles that you have to fight individually and there are battles we have to fight collectively as a body. And so understand, there is, there is this conflict going on. And so not only are we a body, not only are we are a family, but we are also an army. We've got to engage with the powers of darkness. So living as an army, understand that there's rank, order and discipline. An army, people don't just get up and say, okay, man, whom do I shoot today? You know, let's go. Oh, let's go hunting deer today. You know. No. Everybody goes together. Everybody aims the same direction. Everybody goes after the same enemy. There's rank, there's order, there's discipline in an army. Being a part of the army requires a military mindset, a military lifestyle, and a military discipline. A military mindset meaning you're always on alert. When you're engaged in conflict, you're on high alert. What's the enemy up to? Where is he going to attack? What are the enemy's movements? What are the enemy's new strategies? You're always on high alert. So as a people, we've got to be thinking like that. A military mindset. You've got also a military lifestyle. There's a big difference between a civilian lifestyle and a military lifestyle. And we are an army we live like people who are engaging in conflict. Paul, uh, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. That's a military lifestyle. You're sober, you're vigilant because there's an adversary, the devil. We live differently. And there's discipline. Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, he said, whoever engages in warfare does not entangle himself with the affairs of this life. Meaning, You've got responsibilities, but you don't let those responsibilities take precedence over the fact that you are in spiritual conflict. You're very aware, you're keenly aware of your engaging with the enemy. There's discipline. Civilians sleep till 8 o'clock, but when you're in the army, you've got to wake up at, I don't know, 4, 5. It's a discipline lifestyle. There are certain things you do. Training. So as believers, as part of a local body that's an army, we need that. A military mindset, a military lifestyle, a military discipline. Now, here's what I want to close with. We need all these three aspects in proper balance. If we only function like an army, then the church ends up more with casualties and we're shooting each other when we get tired of the enemy, shoot each other and end up doing all those kinds of things. If you only function as a family, then we won't know what to do when the enemy comes up. You take your pillow and 
try to protect yourself. And he said, no, 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 don't use the pillow. You're a soldier. Put on the armor of God and take the shield of faith, not the pillow. The pillow is for the household. It's for the family. So, we've got to learn to move in these three dimensions in proper balance. When we're functioning as a body, you say, what's my role? What's my place? Let me do what I'm supposed to do so the body is doing well. As a family, let me take care of other people. Let me grow. Let me nurture other people. Let me show love, care, and concern and give to one another. That's being family. But then, you're also an army. Okay, I know there's an enemy. I'm going to be on guard for myself. And I'm also going to look out for my brothers and sisters. Engage in spiritual combat and spiritual conflict. Because I realize we're also an army. And so to have these three in proper blend is very important for us as a local church. A body, a family, and an army. Amen? Let's stand to our feet as we take some time just to pray and reflect and then close. Father, we just pray over each one present here this morning. And even for those part of this church but not present here, God, we just pray grace and grace in each one, Father. We pray, God, that you'll open our hearts, open our minds, and help us understand this work that you are doing. And you said, I will build my church. Help us to understand, discern the Lord's body correctly, God. To understand the beauty of what you're doing. The amazing body that you're raising up, Lord. Not only the spiritual aspect, even in the local side, the, the physical expression of that spiritual body that as we learn to relate to one another as we learn to sharpen one another as we learn to give and receive from one another Lord we will grow up together in all things to be like Jesus that we grow up to the full measure of the stature of Christ That Jesus will be fully revealed and expressed through us as a local church in our city and in our nation, oh God. That we will be His hands and feet and His voice, His eyes, His heart, His ears in our city and in our nation, Lord. That truly we will be the body of Christ. So come and do your work in our midst, oh God, like never before. Build a body of people in whom, Lord, you will receive glory, honor, and praise. And Lord, we pray that in all things, in everything that is said and done, Jesus Christ will be preeminent. That in us and through us, people will see no one and nothing but Jesus Christ. That in all things, Jesus, you will be preeminent. It's not about us, but it's about you, Lord. It's about you. Lord, we just pray that there will be many who will rise up to become fathers and mothers in this house find their place and be blessed and equipped to fulfill their function, Lord, in the house. That you will learn to celebrate one another. Celebrate the good things you're doing in us and through us, oh God. We will learn to stand with one another, encourage one another, support one another, lovingly correct one another. That truly, Lord, will be a body, a family, and an army. We ask for grace to become this of God. We thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to encourage you find your place in the local church. God has a place for you. Plug into that place. 
begin to do what God's called you to do. It may be something small. It may be something unseen. Just begin to function in that. And then you'll blossom. You'll blossom in the purpose of God and what God wants for your life. So find your place. God has a place. Don't be afraid to step out. You know, I think one thing that holds us all back is we're afraid. Me, what can I do? Who am I? Don't be afraid to step out. Do it. Be what God's made you to be, designed you to be. Do it. Don't be afraid. Step out. Use what God's given you. Be a blessing to the local church. Be a blessing to the world outside. Amen. Let's close. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you. Lift up His countenance upon you. Surround you with His favor. We trust that this message was a blessing to you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us at contact at apcwo.org. Also, visit our website www.apcwo.org for additional resources. Thank you for listening and God bless you.